very happy to be talking to Victoria Azarenka, the winner of two Grand Slams, Australian Open back to back, and she was the number one player in the WTA computer ranking in 2012, and she is the mother of Leo. I love the story that you talk about your mom. I want you to just run with that right now. There's been so many things that had to happen for me to become a tennis player that it always kind of feels like it was a it, it was a destiny for me. So my mom started working in the tennis center and I was coming to, uh, to see her after, after school. I started at seven, so I went to first grade and that's how, how I, uh, I started. And uh, I was very shy as a kid, even probably nobody will believe that right now, but <laughs> I, was a, I was very shy and uh, I was scared to go anywhere without my mom and she had to let me I had to let her work, so she gave me a tennis racket, gave me a tennis ball, and go hit against the wall, you know, get myself busy. And uh, one of the coaches saw me, they came with this uh, big group of kids into this little gym, and um, this coach, a lady, who offered if I wanted to join, and I was scared, I was like, no, I'm scared, I ran away. And then my mom was like, no, no, go on, like, go try and just have fun. Um, and and that was that was it. Uh, but you know, just the, the thing, the tennis center was close to our apartment at that time. And there was, you know, a lot of connections that that led me to where I am today. You've come a long way, Victoria. You're certainly not like that anymore. Yes, definitely. I'm 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 still shy, but I just I've I've learned how to, uh, how to, you know, be be better with that. Well, okay, so you, you started playing and you found out that you were having fun, but what did you like about it and what were you good at right from the start? Well, I had a lot of fun right away also because my first coach and the environment that I was in, I was around like 40 kids. We started, we didn't start on the court. We started playing different games. It was eye hand coordination. It was uh, relays. So it was a lot about fun and engaging with kids. And there was competition obviously. So, so there, was, there was a fun component. It was always about games and like engaging. And so, but also there was so many kids where like if you hit the ball against the wall and you miss, you gotta go and wait in the end of in the end of the line, and I never wanted to really do that. So I used every opportunity when because my mom worked in a tennis center, I had that opportunity to go and hit against the wall, not on the court. So I remember myself actually like visualizing playing on the big stadiums. I didn't have access, you know, like to go and get inspired by Grand Slam and watching somebody else, and we didn't really have you know, coverage for TV. So it was a lot about my imagination. I knew a little bit about tennis. I knew, you know, you guys were <laughs> were playing, Steffi was coming up and like, I knew a little bit of a history, but later on is where I, I kind of learned more about tennis. So it was a lot of about my imagination. So that was my own little fun world that I created for myself. Um, I felt that I was making my own dreams and living in them, even if it wasn't, happening in the reality. At 14, you moved to Spain to train. And then the year after, at 15, you moved to Arizona to train. How, I mean, that's a young age. How difficult was that to be away from home at that time? But seeing that you were always tugging at your mother's skirts. Yeah, girl. and you, and you know, it, 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 it is very interesting because how I was as a kid and when I did start to play tennis, I became very independent and that and I had to be independent you know it's not only at 14 where I was already like on my own I was on my own at 9 at 10 where I was traveling with other parents even though I had a, a garden but I had to you know like think for myself and my, my parents couldn't travel everywhere my mom did the best she could I was at 10 when I flew over you know from Europe to you to the States 
by myself for the first time. So that experience was obviously like you have to grow, you have to grow up a certain way. You have to rely on yourself a certain way. And now looking back, I have no idea how did my mom do that. <laughs> uh, and even how I did that, like it's it's really surreal. But when you're in the moment, it's 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 a different story. But it taught me how to adapt to new situations, to rely on myself, to to be my own best friend, you know, s sometimes. So it, it's uh, it's it's changed a lot. But I also didn't move to Arizona right away. I came to Saddlebrook first time. Oh, first time. I practiced in Saddlebrook. I, uh, I remember um, uh, actually seeing uh, Justin and uh, practicing there. Um, so yeah, I was already around more a little bit more around pro pro players uh, which was obviously very you know motivating and inspiring for me to to kind of start and in in Arizona you stayed with a friend um, of your mom the family of uh, Nikolai Habibu and uh, uh, his daughter played tennis uh, as well and they were coming over for summer because his wife was from Belarus her name is also Victoria and they were coming to uh, to Belarus, and that's how my mom met them because my mom worked at the court, and uh, and they were very helpful um, in the beginning of my career, and uh, you know helping me financially as well to to make that push into into the uh, pros from juniors, and and then uh, to be to be on my own. So I'm very grateful for them, obviously. I mean, you you had an unbelievable junior career, and I mean, how did that help you? adjust to the pro career you know what, what what really helped me is was being in the ITF team program because I had a great opportunity to go you know it, it was great financial help and it was also a good opportunity to go with different coaches not not uh, and it was my kind of first up first time where I got out of Belarus and trained somewhere else so that was like a first first step I got experience to play uh, we had a rule that you had to play with every other player every week for doubles which was which was amazing so it was like you know constant adaptation um, so that was that was a first push for me like to even go into the juniors um, and then after juniors being you know successful and going on the tour and keep getting humbled in the beginning was was not easy and I, I honestly don't know if it's easier when you're a really good junior and you're coming back and, and you're going into the pros or where you weren't that good and you're kind of developing and going into because I think the expectation level is a little different so personally for me was was tough mentally going from you know winning pretty much everything I think I lost like one or two matches a year to going into playing no matter what the score is and you know those lower lower ranked tournaments is like where everybody just grinds and hustle and they don't they don't care who you are they don't care what the score is it's it's it's, it's brutal so it that was that was not a definitely not an easy experience for me you went on the tour <laughs> when you were 16 and yeah. at 17 you were ranked in the top 50 so the transition from junior to pro seemed to be going smoothly. Do you remember, what was your first big win? My f biggest win, I will say, um, I got a wild card into a 50,000 in Luxembourg because I finished number one as a junior. So you had that opportunity. You had three wild cards. You got 175K, 150K, and 125. Um, so I went to, to that tournament and it was right after, I think, yeah, it was right after Wimbledon on clay and it was my first win. I won the 50,000 50, in, in, uh, in Luxembourg. So that was, a, um, that was a really good first opportunity for me to kind of finally getting my grip, you know, that I'm, I'm also can be good in pros. But when I, when I think of you back then, two words come to my mind, and they are determined and intense. Yeah. And, you know, I really think that, um, I want you to talk about those attributes and also how important the mental side of the game was for you. Well, mental side of the game is 
num I, I would say number one. Obviously, you need talent. Obviously, you need to have skill to be able to play tennis. But what separates you from good to great, and Chrissy, you know that better than ever, than anybody, that's what, what, what's going to take you to the top. And it's not necessarily in tennis. It's really anywhere in life. I had that work ethic, ethic from from the get-go, like I, I saw my parents work really, really hard. My, my dad worked three jobs, my mom worked two jobs. So for me, that was, I didn't know what it's like, you know, just having it easy. It was always push. As soon as you see opportunity, you grab it with two hands because you don't know if you're gonna have that other opportunity. So, so that for me was as soon as I see something, I'm gonna go for it. And I had actually a pretty, um, pretty bad experience. I, I've never actually talked about it. Um, when I was 10 years old and the first time I came to the States, I, I was with, with this family and they were helping out and I did something really bad and they punished me for it. I, and it was, and it's silly, like if thinking about it, it's so silly. I jumped out of, I jumped in the pool where you were not supposed to jump. You were a 10 year old kid, right? So they said I wasn't, you know, listening, I wasn't behaving well, so they sent me home and I wasn't able to play a tournament. And I think that was, that made me feel so, so bad and that I was like, I'm never gonna lose another opportunity like that again. So that, that, first of all, that made me like, I'm gonna prove, I'm gonna prove these people that they were wrong for doing that. And that determination and that intensity like just 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 rise up and it's funny because I know these people this day I, I know them I, their daughter actually plays tennis and I actually hit with her a couple years ago but it's just you know it's kind of like a full circle but that 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 particular moment like it could have you know make me weaker and make me lose you know maybe motivation or whatever but that one was like okay I'm not gonna lose. I'm not gonna make that. I'm not gonna lose another opportunity where I have. So going along, following your journey, 2012, you ended up year-end WTA number one. Had a great year. Um, mm -hmm. Won the Australian Open. Backed it up in 2013. At, at that time, you were starting to play Serena quite a bit, and I I, I always sense that Serena probably feared you more than anybody else during that time. But I loved when you walked out on the court with her. Unlike other women players, you s just strolled out there looking like you had a, l a lot of confidence and weren't intimidated by her at all. What, what was it like playing her? Yeah, I mean, I, I watched Serena obviously before, before I, was, I was on tour. So um, I already was, I mean, it's hard not to be intimidated because I always say it's it's a skill. What what she does, what some players do, and I learned that skill. I think myself is is uh, and it's very valuable. But for me, that was that was exciting. The, the the bigger the challenge there was, it was exciting for me. I wanted to do that. I wanted to play the toughest players. I wanted to play on the biggest stages. It. I know it sounds to a lot of people like it can be scary and it was scary for me of course it it is is scary to go out there in front of 25,000 people and feel like i don't want to embarrass myself but that what always drove me to to go like that's what motivated me to to practice harder to um so i always looked at her at somebody who i know is going to make me suffer but is going to make me better so the intimidation factor from how I grew up and from what I've gone through when I was a kid, that wasn't scary. That that wasn't there wasn't that. I I knew that if if I can do my best, I have a chance. I have a chance. We're all human. No matter how good you are, you're all human. So I I always believe that if I can if I can give my best on every single point, and even if I don't win, I'm gonna give the hell to my opponent. And I think that that kind of what everybody knows when they play against me is that no matter the score is you have to win every single point and you have to earn every single point so i think that's also one of the things that she she maybe doesn't experience with other players 
Um, and I, w I won't, I don't know if it's a fear. I think that we both have a lot of respect for each other's game and um, personality, perseverance. So I think that the matchup is, is quite interesting for people. But in 2016, we're, we're gonna jump to 2016. That year started out with a bang. I mean, you won back to back, Indian Wells beating Serena. You won Miami. By the way, those two tournaments, only three, three women have won and you are one of the three. That's, that's a tough feat. That's like winning almost two Grand Slams in, in a month. And you won those two. And I remember commentating both those tournaments. And I remember saying on TV, this is uh, Vika's year. I think she's gonna end up being number one because you looked unstoppable. You looked unbelievable and the best you've ever looked. And a couple months later, <laughs> uh, you announced that you were pregnant. And yeah. um, that, you know, that's, that's, life-changing you're i thought in the peak of your tennis how, how did you feel at that time well at that you know a lot of people don't obviously know what was happening in 2016 and it was it was really i was i was ready to play the off season i will say that you know i was i was meant i would say i was mentally prepared the most to like go get go get it I would say I wasn't at my best physically. I think I was better, I'm better physically now and physically when maybe in 12, in 13, I had a little bit more injuries, I would say. But mentally I was ready, you know what, I'm gonna go get it. Like I was, I was there and there was so much happening in my life, in my family life at that moment where after the, after the tournaments, you know, Miami and uh, Indian Wells happened, I came home to a most devastating news, which shook me. And it was like, oh, you ha you gotta go play tennis. And you're like, uh, how? And then all the things were swirling and stuff. And then I found out I was pregnant. So there was so many things that going on at that time that I didn't even, I, honestly, I wasn't sure if I was gonna touch the racket again. So it was, it was the best, the beginning kind of the year professionally because I felt like well, you know what it was that was going to be professional was going to be my year but mentally and family was such a tough moment so the disbalance kind of started this whole um new chapter for me like completely yeah. new chapter that um I I can't it, it's very hard for me to speak like on past experience because I feel like it has been so long ago it's been so long ago and I feel so different from who I was before because this, over these few years, I've grown so much as a, as a person. That year was, was a tough one for sure. Yeah, well then you had Leo, so that was, yeah. you know, I, I've seen what a great mother you are, so. But then you had Leo and um, I'm just wondering how has motherhood changed you? I'm sure you've answered that a million times, but really it changed everything in terms of you know tennis was is not it, just not the priority for me um, it's not my number one priority but it's something that I love to do but I, I still have my goals and I still have my dreams and I want to achieve that I want to I still want to achieve them but learning how to balance that emotionally was is a challenge. I still feel like I am learning that. And I, I don't think I was prepared for that. I don't, I didn't have an example of someone who has done it. I mean, obviously Kim has done it. There were few players who have kind of done that before, but they weren't at the expense to ask questions, to like know how to navigate those things. So I had to learn so many, so many things and adjust. And as simple as thing, like I, I look at some players, some young players, like from a mother's point, like I want to help them before it was like all focus on me. It's not that I don't care about everybody else, but I was just so self focused on myself and what I have to do. And that changes because I need to think about somebody else before my own now. So that, that changed my relationships with people, with friends changed. I've, 
I found like I guess more of my feminine side but yeah it's 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 definitely a life-changing experience and with everything even that happened I, I won't take anything back it's the mother side of you but it was also the nurturing side of you yeah. that came out and you were aware of everything around you more I mean that was my observation than before when you were really tunnel vision yeah. but when you came back was the focus and and con you know concentration was that as intense or was there was a or was it different well at the beginning at the beginning it was just when i just start, started like first two tournaments um it was the focus was there like i i really wanted to play but it was so hard for me to i felt so guilty I felt so guilty for like taking time for myself like at like as soon as my practice was finished like I would I'll pack and I go like I won't even take a a second to like breathe and just relax like everything was about about Leo so I wouldn't necessarily even say that it was focused I was just doing so much that I didn't have even opportunity sometimes to rest and like I won't I wouldn't let Leo sleep you know when I had matches, like I felt so bad for like, you know, I wanted him to sleep with me. So, so, so that was, that was kind of the things that I'm, I had to learn how to, how to balance and how to process, uh, process them. And it was new for me. So I was adapting and adapting. And, and then after my situation happened, um, my focus just wasn't there to, I don't know how it would be there for for really for anybody and you know I think I've done my best to to be to be there but it was it, it was tough I I feel like I I couldn't pull myself out of the situation to give 100% to my craft even for a little bit it was it was it was tough for me so it just wasn't fun for me and when it's not fun for me to play and go out there on the court um, that's that's a challenge because I play with my heart. I play with passion. Uh, I really give everything I have on the court. So it was. It's not necessarily the will and the want. Is more about learning how to dissociate things that are happening, like life. You know, life right here, and then tennis right here. And before it was just tennis. It's just tennis and everything else is just, you know, it's fun stuff. So there was, became life and then tennis and to, to juggle those things um, is, is, is a process for me. But it's, it has taught me so much that in a way, in a weird way, I'm a little grateful for it. Yeah, it's, it's about compartmentalizing, I think, and it's easy. Yeah. It seems easy, but it's not because it has to do with your emotions. But in yeah. 2017, you know, you're talking a little bit about how it wasn't logistically easy for you because you did face some custody obstacles and you didn't know whether you didn't have a schedule. You didn't know whether you could plan to play this tournament or did you have to be back in the country in this tournament? I mean, I know this is a personal issue for you, but can you talk a little bit about those obstacles yeah I didn't know at any time when I'm gonna go I mean there there are times where I knew two days before the tournament that I can actually go and play the tournament um, so organizing that you know and trying to regroup yourself was just the best you can do the best you can do so that that was challenging that I think that uncertainty in that way was something that I'm just not used to having somebody else control my life where I'm the one who who always have done it have my own schedule and stuff so for me that was that was really really difficult like not knowing what I'm gonna do because I always felt that preparation is the key to success if you're prepared you know you can you can still lose matches, but you give yourself the best opportunity to to do well. And I just never gave, never had that opportunity to to give myself that opportunity to prepare, to to train. You know, so uh, I always felt that my confidence knew that 
I haven't done everything I could the way I want to, the, the way I want to prepare. And other players, you know, are stepping up and, and, and training and having their full schedule and matches. And I mean, I, I'm doing everything I can in the situation, but not everything I can to be the best and where I want to be. So, but I'm still expecting myself to do what I want to do. So that was like, I mean, you can't really jump over your own head sometimes. So that's again, like a, like a, like a, like a learning, like a learning experience for me. So that was, that was difficult. And, and, and I couldn't get, even get myself, you know, kind of confident enough because in the back of my mind, I knew if I haven't done everything the way I, I need to do it, it's going to be tough. I, I think knowing you, I feel like you're a very multi-dimensional person and you uh, you know you're fascinating you you are fascinating um <laughs> work that in motion right now and i mean i feel like um you have other interests you have other skills it's just not about tennis and recently you were very involved politically in the wta on the wta player council mm -hmm. what was that like for you was that stimulating it was really fun uh, for me because it was a different type of different type of challenge, and I, w I, I keep I kept hearing from some of the players that oh you know nothing is ever done like nobody listens to us so I was like you know what let, like let me just try and and see how it is for me if it's if it doesn't work it doesn't work but I felt that my voice was heard um, and we had opportunity to change some things and it was in a progress where, in a process where we, I felt that could have been pretty well um, and much better done. And, and I was, when I, f when I was in the room with like tournaments, it got me to understand like what their needs and like combine what players need. So I was very happy that the impact that you can do for others, you know, by using your voice, by bringing your intention. So for me, I had a blast and I, and I, I want to do more because I love our sport. I want to see it do well. I want to push it as much forward on the council or not on the council. I feel that there, there are ways. And what's really important for me, like after I, 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 I stopped, is the legacy that you kind of give and helping younger players. I want to see younger players better than all of us, you know, and doing good and pushing, pushing well sport because that's what I love. And I think that's just a natural, um, natural cycle because I appreciate everything that you guys have done for us to be in the position. So I look at it from that, that way where it's like, in a way, like passing the torch you know, and you and you gotta give it to the younger generation, and they gotta carry that, and they gotta get it better. So I've always, I've always, um, I always thought about it that way, not a, really about myself, but just like how can we grow the sport? Because I, I genuinely love our sport. Well, and you're you're so right because okay, Billie Jean in that generation, they started the Virginia Slims Tour, the WTA, and then it got handed down to Martina and I. Then it got handed down to. You know, the next generation really wasn't as involved. So, but you got to still be involved because you, you, it's, it's, you got to keep working at it so it doesn't go away. You know, and I, I think that I, I want to point out that I don't know. You don't have one of these yet, do you? This is the number one WTA world number one. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, well, you're going to get this one, and it does have, or it has one diamond in it. And I was looking for my diamond. And I know it's here. I think it's in the back. Yeah, it's right there somewhere. But um, I guess this lends itself to me asking you the question, how does it feel to be the WTA year-end number one? Because it's different than winning a Grand Slam. How does it feel to end the year as number one? It feels amazing. And, you know, I think if you put it in a broader perspective, like, you know, I'm number one in the world in my field. Like if you compare it to like, oh, I'm number one lawyer in the world, number one doctor in the world, number one player of the NBA, like whatever it is, it's such a, it, this achievement makes it so much better. It makes it so much bigger and so much better when you think about it this way. When you're a tennis player, I felt at that time, 
I obviously didn't think of it this way, but now I, I see it and appreciate it from a different perspective. At that time, I was just like, you know what? Like, I worked really hard. I feel like I deserve it. Uh, a little bit cocky in a way also. Like, yeah, you know, like, I, I've, I've done this. Like, this, I'm number one. And, and something that you kind of, like, achieve, want to achieve. And, and, and I think the, the difference why you feel finishing number one is that you were there consistently. Like, it wasn't just, you know, I want something and then like I didn't deliver like you have to deliver that week after week after week after week so I think that's what makes it um you know more special in that way I agree I mean it's it's about the consistency which is which is what this trophy is um I want to thank you and I just want to say you are a very powerful young woman and you are a great leader to all of us you're a great leader in tennis and you're doing some good things and um, I wish you all the luck in the second time around in your career and being a mom and you know you just you seem like you have a light around you so I'm really happy for you Vika. <laughs> Thank you Chrissy I appreciate it and I wouldn't I wouldn't have think of anyone better to do this uh, interview with so I appreciate you I appreciate everything you've you've done inspired motivated continue to do so I love how you come to your academy and brighten up everybody's day and like kids kids all of a sudden start to move their feet a little faster than <laughs> than the other days when you're not there so um I can't wait to see you more uh chat with you more and thank you so much for for this opportunity we're in the same we're living in the same city so we've already had yeah. dinner together and uh yeah once the COVID passes, we'll see each other much more, I'm sure. <laughs> sure. Okay, thank you, Vika. You're great. Thank you.